Hi, in this video I will present to you why I think that a right Sturzhau is shown in the imagery of 133, specifically when we face an inactive first ward. Last time I argued just from the view of fighting effectiveness, now we will need to take a closer look at the manual. But first grab a sword or even just a pen and take a look at your elbow. If we want to strike a Schielhau, a right Treer or Unterhau, or even a left Sturzhau, our elbow pulls to our center line and faces downwards. If we go for a thrust or a right Sturzhau instead, it is still possible to have our elbow facing downwards, but it would be way more comfortable to let it face sideways to our right. Okay, let's keep this in mind and now let me present to you the Segi Tunic Theory. Okay, let's browse through 133 from the start. As you might have noticed, uh, at the elbows there are some overhanging tunic left. My proposition would be that uh, these saggy tunic balls are indicating where the elbow actually is. And this is specifically interesting if the arms are stretched wide out. So in this picture I would say uh, the elbows are facing downwards. In this image I would say the priest is already yielding to the bind. And down here we have our Schildschlag with an elbow facing downwards as well. So as you can hopefully see, uh, the saggy tunics are all over the place, so I stop marking them and I'll have a closer look at exceptions. Okay, here on folio 6R we see Crooker the first time from the other side. And we know when we uh, conduct Crooker, the sword points to our left. Why? Well, in the text it says, as I said above, the priest enters, therefore beware his head. So the priest actually thrusts under the sword of the scholar, therefore he should be aware of an attack to his own head. Okay, now focus your attention on the elbow of the scholar. As you can see, there's no saggy tunic there. And if you're a human like me, if you want to point your thumb down and to the left, your elbow actually has to face sidewards. So I conclude, if we don't see a saggy tunic, we see an elbow facing sidewards. Good, let's continue browsing through 133. The second time we see a non saggy tunic is actually in the second play of 133. Here I would argue the priest tries to overbind the scholar with this false edge to set up a Durchtreten, a strike on the right or even with more enemy pressure a strike on the left. And the Durchtreten is exactly what we see in the next folio. On 10R, on the down right, we have another interesting case. This time it's a buckler arm of the scholar. A position where we also see the elbow and which would be quite good for grappling as Fiora would surely confirm. Okay, let's keep this in mind and carry on. So here we are, folio 11v, the play I discussed last time. And would you know it, there's a non saggy sword arm of the scholar. Um, please note that the uh, buckler arm is still saggy, so that elbow is pointing downwards. I would conclude that the sword arm elbow points sideways towards the viewer. So that's why I think that the uh, right ox end position would not only be beneficial out of uh, sword fighting efficiency aspects, but also from interpreting the imagery of 133. Okay, but now let's have a look how far we can take this saggy tunic hypothesis. On the next folio we see again the inverted buckler hand with the elbow upwards, a position I consider to be good for grappling and would you know it, there is some grappling.
On 13R lower plate we might find a violation of this principle. Here we see a very high half shield, but I would still think that both thumbs would be facing kind of upwards. But as you can try for yourself, if you lift your hand to head height, your elbow slowly moves sideways. On 14R we see a Schildschlag with a non saggy tunic and you might ask what to do. Well hopefully I will be able to shoot a video with my interpretations of the accompanying strike depending on enemy sword position within the next few weeks. On 16V there is a grabbing of the sword in Langort, where a sideways elbow makes sense if the sword is quite vertical. Right after the half point of the manual, this theory starts to fall apart. Not only because such a high half shield doesn't make sense in that condition, but also on the down left we see this saggy tunic less and less defined. So from here on out we see less and less saggy tunics at all in straight arms. Even here at the down right one might argue that the shield kind of faces upwards but that gets into speculative territory really fast and I would expect an elbow down position in this image at least for the scholar. To conclude I would argue that the elbow position is a detail which got lost in the process of the manual. Just like the positioning of the feet which only lasted for the first few folios. As you may know, there might have been several artists working on 133. Frank Sinato and André Suprenant identify up to 22 different illustration styles in their book Le Livre de l'Art du Combat. They exactly identify a break on the style on 17R and another on 17V, which is then consistent for about 20 folios. So, I hope you like my argumentation and I would very much like to discuss this with you. For now, I would like to thank you all for your feedback on my last video, which made me look into the theory more deeply. So, this is to you guys, and see you next time.